Young Lawyer Rising from the ABA Young Lawyers Division and Legal Talk Network. Welcome back, listeners. I'm your host, Montana Funk. Today, Paul Mark Sandler joins us to offer advice on being a successful litigation attorney. Mr. Sandler is of counsel in the law firm Shapiro, Shergano, and Sandler. He has represented a variety of clients in both civil and criminal trials and appeals. He's the founder of the litigation section of the Maryland State Bar Association, a frequent lecturer on trial and appellate practice, and most recently authored the book, The Fine Art of Trial Advocacy, a Young Lawyer's Resource for Success. I'm so excited to have him here with us today. Good morning, Mr. Sandler. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning to you, Montana, and it's a pleasure to be with you. So, Mr. Sandler, I have to say I'm very excited about this episode because I recently, about a year and a month ago now, started becoming um, a criminal trial attorney. So I was a litigation attorney before that, and then I switched to criminal, and I've kind of had a lot more experience in the last year doing trials and being in the courtroom. So this is an episode that I'm just very eager to record because I think that it's such a fun topic and clearly we're both quite passionate about it. So thank you for coming on. Well, as I said, it's my pleasure and congratulations to you in the selection of an area of law to focus on. It is the most, in my humble opinion, challenging and sometimes difficult aspects of practicing trial law. Well, thank you. And I kind of want to start off. It's I think a lot of our listeners probably do civil practice or maybe practice that's not even litigation. And I think it's important for this episode for you to kind of tell our listeners just a basic rundown of what a trial actually looks like, what parts there are to a trial kind of from start to finish, if you wouldn't mind. I don't. I want to comment, though, further on your endeavor to become experienced in criminal defense. The happiest times in my career were when I represented defendants in criminal cases and there was an acquittal and I knew that in my heart, my client was truly innocent. I really always rejoiced in in those circumstances. So in terms of a trial itself, I think all of us have seen television shows demonstrating aspects of trials. We've all seen my cousin Vinny, for example. (laughs) And the trial is basically structured pretty simply. We have, after jury selection, which is an episode in itself, we begin with opening statements. And after the opening statements, moving party begins conducting direct examination, then cross-examination, and eventually the other side has a chance to present its case with direct examination and then cross, and then they're closing arguments. Now, it's simply stated, but it is more complex when one focuses on the details. One of the crucial aspects of trying a case is the preparation. And then overarching all are the concepts of ethics and professionalism. For example, you're preparing a witness for trial and the lawyer says, by the way, if on cross-examination, a question comes that you think hurts our case, just say you don't remember. Hello, disbarment, in my opinion, unethical. Ethics is everywhere in preparation and in the trial itself. Your witness is not telling the truth after you went through it all. And on the witness stand, she or he is not telling the truth. What do you do? Well, you better know the ethical rules in your state as well as the uh, ABA canons because they're obligations that we have. Thank you. And I kind of want to break that up into a couple different parts. So you know, we've all who have been trial attorneys, at least have probably been through a rigorous prep where you're working long hours the weekend before preparing for all those steps, like you said, you know, prepping witnesses. So the first thing I want to talk about, and then we'll touch ethics later, with those steps in the trial, is there one step, whether it be 
voir dire, which is jury selection for those who are listening, or opening, et cetera, that you think is the most important in helping your case? That's a very good question. Everyone has their own opinion. Many people say opening statement because it's the first impression the jury has of you, the lawyer. Others say it's cross-examination. Others say it's this. My opinion is, believe it or not, it depends on the case. It depends on the defendants, if you're in criminal trials and, and even civil. All are important. And it reminds me of an Aesop fable I once read as a kid, where each part of the body had a great debate that they were the most important. The hand said, I'm more important. The toe said, I'm more important. And after all the rigmarole, they agreed that they were each equally important, depending on what the human being was doing at the time. I think each part of the trial is important, but there are concepts now in the art of persuasion. Now, my view of the trial is that it is one giant argument. That's right. It's an argument. And you argue in your opening statement, you argue in your direct, you argue in your cross, you argue in your summation. And our listeners are gonna say, what? That's wacky, you can't argue an opening statement or the judge will be angry and the opposing counsel will object. And here's how you do argue an opening statement. You simply say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, during this trial, the evidence will show and everything I tell you now is what the evidence will be. Or you'll say, I will prove, and then you sort of put that in argument form, and that's what the evidence will be. So in direct examination, of course, you can't ask leading questions, but you ask non-leading questions, and guess what? You argue there by the witness arguing for you in the answers and the technique of what is called looping. What's that? Here's an example. Did you go to the bar last week, Saturday evening? Yes. When you went to the bar last week, Saturday evening, what did you see? Aha. Uh -huh. When you went to the bar then and you saw the fight, could you see who threw the first punch? Yes. So you see, it, when you're looping, you're including the answer to the previous question, the next question. It's a form of helping your direct arguing. And cross-examination, you have those short leading questions. And I've always found, by the way, in cross-examination, instead of saying you went to the bar uh, the 15th of June, is that correct? Why add is that correct? It sort of breaks it up. You went to the bar last week. You saw a fight. Yes. You it's Short, simple statements with a voice inflection. To me, that's comfortable for me. But bear in mind, all of us have our own styles. There's one thing I do want to say. In order to appreciate how the trial can proceed for your benefit, in my humble opinion, a trial lawyer needs to appreciate the art of persuasion, how persuasion works. And bear in mind, having a cultural appreciation of the development of persuasion as an art is extremely crucial for me because that's how I learned. And I never forgot when I struggled through reading Aristotle's great work on persuasion called Rhetoric, his three most important points of persuasion. He coined this phrase, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos, he claims is one of the most important parts of persuasion. And you'll laugh, everyone, when you hear what it is. Ethos is the listener's perception of you and your character. So if you're a likable person, the jury's impressed, the judge likes you, you have a leg up. And of course, pathos is emotion. And when we use emotion, we have to be sincere, not overdo it. And I think logos is the most difficult one, but very important, and that's logic. Logic is broken down into inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. We don't have time for me to elaborate or I'll take all day. But those are the concepts. Everyone has their own idea. Of course, a trial can be like a story, not a lie, but and have a theme. 
And if we have a theme and tell a story, everyone loves to hear stories, put it in that format, that's helpful. And finally, in terms of these views, I need to share this with you because it's been on my mind for a number of years. And I've talked about this in lectures around the country. My opinion, if one seeks to be a great trial lawyer, and we all do, one has to try cases, win and lose, and learn from our mistakes. Having tried cases for over 50 years, I could have an encyclopedia of my mistakes that I learned from, but wow, at the time they were humiliating and embarrassed. And now today they're very funny, very funny. I mean, if I have a yeah. minute, one time I'm in a trial and there was no jury, thank goodness. And in the middle of my direct examination, I raised my hand. The judge said, excuse me, what's that? I said, well, your honor, I have a question. Counsel, this is not a classroom. This is a courtroom. If you have a question, you say, excuse me, may Counsel approached the bench. I said, thank you, Your Honor. Excuse me, may we approach the bench? No. <laughs> I was very young. Yeah. I said, well, I don't know what to do. He says, you ask your next question. I said, but Your Honor, I forgot what they taught me in law school, how to put this in evidence. You mean how to authenticate an exhibit? Yes, that's it. I've had it. Mr. Moser, this court, that's opposing counsel. This court will yeah. take a 15 minute recess teach this young lawyer how to authenticate a document and uh, I will return. And then he closes the door, comes back and opens the door and says, Moser, take the witness stand and let Sandler practice. He closes the door. Well, of course I learned a lot from that. How can you go to court and not be prepared for everything, let alone how to authenticate an, an exhibit? And I tell this not only because it's simplistic to think about, but today with social media, there are special requirements to authenticate social media evidence and yes, or digital right. evidence. So it's very important, A, you learn to be prepared from that example and understand that you need to authenticate properly. Absolutely. And I kind of want to unpack, there was a lot there, so I'll unpack a couple of different things. I think one of the first things you had mentioned was, you know, making argument throughout the whole trial. And like you had said, people are going to say, why would I argue in opening? We're taught, you know, that's not allowed. And you had a good way of saying it, that this is what the evidence is going to show. And I remember one of my trial advocacy lawyers taught us, don't ever promise something is going to be in evidence if you're not sure, right? So that was kind of like our golden rule. So something that I'm curious that, you know, you've seen over your years of practice is what is a common mistake that you can see in young or new trial attorneys that you think could be remedied fairly easy that you would like to offer up as you know a piece of advice something that you've seen is just a simple little mistake that us new trial attorneys make that with a simple remedy can fix it it's a good question again i would give you three possible problems or challenges i believe that frequently in opening statements we object to opposing counsel when we should not. And remember I talked about ethos, the jury's perception of you. Well, if you constantly get overruled in a hundred objections, your ethos goes down in my opinion. So that's a mistake. It's also a, a common mistake and that's not joining with opposing counsel in ironing out pretrial wrinkles. And so much can be accomplished. I mean, you certainly can't show something, uh, a video an opening statement without reviewing it with opposing counsel and getting the judge's permission. So I think a lot of problems face us in the pretrial. We don't always have cooperative opposing counsel, and that's a shame. One of the hallmarks of a great trial lawyer is integrity, ethics, professionalism, and trying to help out. Also in the trial, I think that oftentimes young lawyers in particular can't break away from that non-leading question in direct examination. And my suggestion for that is think of the word weather. Because, you know, when the judge is there, the jury's there, you're focusing and you ask this question, objection, leading, sustained. Objection, leading, sustained. Well, think of the word weather. Instead of saying, did you go to the tavern? Did you go to the tavern last night? That's not leading. But 
You saw the argument there, didn't you? Objection, leading, sustain, and you ask again, sustain. Think of, can you tell us whether or not you saw an argument at the tavern that night? Just work it that way. Whether is a good word to break that problem of leading questions on direct. The last point I wanna make is on a cross-examination, and that is we have to remember it is important not to offend the jury by being overzealous. Uh, a physician, for example, doesn't remember something she wrote in her hospital records. Instead of going through this impeaching and dancing around, try to refresh recollection. Would anything help you remember my notes? Well, here they are now. Isn't it correct? Blah, blah, blah. So I think you have to be very attentive to the listener. You're talking to the listener. And I will say to you, I try to avoid mistakes by the technique of a mock trial before every case, civil or criminal. I won't bore you with the many tales of how I learned through a mock jury, don't go there. And I always have a jury consultant. I learned that. And you know who I learned it from? Believe it or not, Thurgood Marshall. I had an interview with him as a youngster, and he told me before Brown against Board of Education, he was at Howard University Law School, moot courting the oral argument. He told me that a, a student at 10 at night asked a question he couldn't get an answer to. He worked very late at night and found the answer. And the next day, he told me one of the justices asked that question. And I was very young and not even at the bar at the time, but it, it's helped me because I remembered it. And I've never gone into a major trial without that. And, and here is why. One of the techniques of persuasion is to tailor your argument to the listener. I mean, if you're arguing before a judge and you know that he has a strong opinion on this particular area of law, you want to let him know you know that you're not trying to offend. He might say, I realize, Your Honor, you're a specialist in this and it's of keen interest, but nevertheless, there's an exception here and that's why. And one time I uh, cross in a mock trial, I cross-examined a, a juror, uh, someone portraying that witness, and I pointed out that she lied in the grand, her grand jury testimony. And then in the mock argument, I mentioned that to the jury and pointed it out. And when I saw the jurors deliberate through this one-way mirror, they were absolutely furious that I asked that set of questions. And I don't have to get into the reason why. But the point is, when I appreciated that, I stayed away from it at trial. So you learn a lot from doing a mock trial or a moot court practice. And I suggest that to our listeners who are young and not familiar with this concept. I think that's a great piece of advice. I know that being, I was on the trial team in law school when I was there, and that was super helpful coming into, you know, working in a job that was more trials, just having that experience. And I want to take a quick break. And then when we get back, I do want to talk about the ethics issues a little bit before we have to wrap up today. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back and jump into some ethics issues. Here's a fact about lawyers who switched jobs in the last 12 months. 37% of them moved in pursuit of better work-life balance. I'm Joshua Lennon, lawyer in residence at Clio, and this is just one finding from our recent Legal Trends report. Given irregular schedules and long hours that lawyers often dedicate to their clients, it's no surprise that many are willing to leave in pursuit of a more manageable work life. When interviewing at a law firm, double-check to see if they offer work-from-home options, the ability to adjust your hours when necessary, and have cloud-based software to support that. For more information on what law firms can do to keep good people like you, download Clio's Legal Trends Report for free at clio.com forward slash trends. That's Clio spelled C-L-I-O dot com slash trends. The American Bar Association provides access to career-changing and life-changing opportunities. Connect with an ever-expanding community of like-minded individuals who believe in leaving the world a better place than when they found it. 
Tap into resources, continuing education, member groups, benefits, and services focused on advancing growth and knowledge in the legal profession. Join us in our pursuit of making a positive impact for all. The American Bar Association. So we're back from the break. And Mr. Sandler, I think there's a couple of things that we talked about in the first half that are super important. One of the things you had mentioned was a tip for trial attorneys to meet with opposing counsel and go over everything, you know, that's going to be brought in before trial stipulations, etc. I think that Part of that is also having a good relationship with opposing counsel. Now, that's not to say you need to be best friends with them, hang out with them on weekends, but having that cordial relationship can also show the jury, right, that, like you said, you're likable. I think it helps trials move smoother. And there are some ethics issues that kind of get into play with that in terms of like disclosing evidence, exhibits, et cetera. So jumping into the ethics side of things, what ethics issues do you think trial attorneys need to be aware of, some that maybe aren't as talked about, but that you see, you know, commonly in practice that you want these listeners to say, hey, look, this is an ethical issue. You need to be aware of this. Well, there are many, many, too many to cover here. I would say that there are many ethical issues with witness preparation and ethical issues with trial procedures. During the trial, there are ethical issues, and there are books and treatises available. The ABA Canons of Ethics is phenomenal. It's really the, the standard for ethical issues arising in trials all across this country. But let's take a look at some of them again. I mentioned to you witness preparation. It's extremely important to make sure that your client is telling the truth. It's also important if, let's say, before the trial, you receive in discovery documents that inadvertently were sent. It's important to contact counsel and return the document and discuss that. It's also important in trial. Now, back to trial, to make sure that you do not disregard the prior rulings of the court in the excitement and energy of trying to persuade, sometimes that happens. And that's not good. That is violating ethical standards of, of proceeding. Also, in terms of witness preparation parts, if you're going to have an affidavit from a witness, there are ethical guidelines regarding the signing of the affidavit. There are cases that say you just can't run up and say, sign here, my friend. You have to get the facts from that witness and then incorporate them in the affidavit. There are exceptions, like if the facts are in a case or you know the facts prior, but there are ethics involving that. And of course, one of the most serious ethics comes up in examining witnesses, which you alluded to. Here's a case that will illustrate a very important point on cross-examination. It's the case of Lord Russell in England, lived in the Mayfair district. He was murdered at night, slit throat ear to ear. The Crown in the 1800s had two choices to indict, if I can use that term. And that would have been the Swiss butler, Cavossier, or the maid. They selected Cavossier based on the evidence. Maid is innocent. Cross-examining the maid is defense counsel because the Crown put the maid on for direct. In cross-examination, the lawyer leading questions, and not exactly, but my phraseology, you told your sister you hated Lord Russell. Yes. You told your girlfriend if you had a knife, you'd plunge it into his heart. Yes. And she starts weeping and crying and goes on. He was convicted and there was a hang, you know, ex execution. But ethical scholars for decades have been debating the ethics during the cross-examination. This is the point. 
the lawyer goes to the tower to meet his client, Kavosar, and Kavosar confesses to the crime and says, you got to get me off. Then he goes back and continues asking those leading questions, suggesting she's really the murderer. And scholars have debated this because is it ethical to impugn the credibility and accusing her of murder when you know you know she's innocent? And this has been going on for years, this debate. In the Supreme Court case, I think it was Justice White, not focusing on this particularly, but made the observation that if defense counsel knows she actually said these words, it's permissible. If not, of course, that's totally unethical. So that carries over to other aspects of cross-examination, whether it's criminal or civil. You can't use fake facts, so to speak, to impugn. So that's another ethical. And then in closing argument, there are a number of ethical issues, and that is you need to not misstate intentionally or even by accident, really, the facts. You can't get too um, enthusiastic. You have to stay to what the facts are, and you cannot also, and this is another ethical issue, criticize opposing counsel. There was a case where a lawyer stated, I don't understand how Mr. Sons could even bring this case. It has no merit whatsoever. Bad. Cannot do that. And be aware that different states have different rules relating in criminal cases about what to do when your client, for example, is perjuring herself or himself. You have to read the, the rules. Uh, some states require you to offer to get out or to be critical. Other states say if it's criminal, you do, you're not obligated. And it's also very unethical to be criticizing the judge during trial, particularly publicly. There's one case where lawyers in the courtroom during a break criticized the judge and the judge came back and said, I heard that, I clarify that, and that was not so correct for you to do that because he was recording everything in the courtroom in chambers. So we have to be always mindful of what's correct, what's appropriate, and what makes it a fair trial for everyone. Not easy to accomplish, but no, I agree with that. And I, I, especially when your emotions are running in trial, I think that any trial attorney can agree that even though it's our job and we're able to do it as our job, you, there still are emotions when you're invested in a trial and you're putting in a bunch of hours of work. And something that I'm wondering is how do you balance the, in closing specifically, being argumentative, because closing obviously is where we get to be the most argumentative. So how do you balance that with also not kind of exaggerating the facts or, you know, saying something like this was brought out and, you know, I, I can't think of an example right now, but just something where you're harping on something being, let's say, outrageous or complete inflation of the facts. Let's say you say something like that against the other side, how we're balancing being argumentative and strong and powerful in our position versus being a little bit too much on the edge of unethical. Members of the jury, three weeks ago during opening statement, if you recall, I said to you, I would prove that Mr. Whiskers, the plaintiff in this case, lacks credibility totally. And I also pointed out to you that you could not believe him. Remember, the key evidence in this case is the deposition, his deposition, page 36, where he admitted that in other situations he had lied under oath he lied in a grand jury testimony as a witness in a criminal case that the facts here are similar. He lied when he was uh, answering interrogatories that he cannot be believed. He's the only witness, despite the eloquence of Mr. Jenkins, the uh, plaintiff's counsel. His client is just unbelievable. That's you know, an example. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think something I want to touch on too before we wrap up today, and I think this is kind of a loaded question, so I apologize. But if you could have one 
piece of advice to new trial attorneys to be successful in the courtroom, remain calm, have that presence about them that they understand they're going to make mistakes. We all do. People who have been practicing for years make mistakes. So that's okay. But what is something that you would tell an attorney who's stepping into their first trial to just help them have a presence in the courtroom that you think will help them be successful? Well, that's not a simple answer. I'll do my best. First of all, you should have a lead counsel, if this is your first case, either sitting at counsel table to help you. Secondly, you would notify, I would suggest, if you're really, if your first or second trial, notify the judge's clerk to tell him or her, and I'd also notify opposing counsel. Opposing counsel can always help young lawyers. I remember oh, so many situations where older lawyers, more seasons have helped me. I know we don't have the time, but I'll have to say that one time in a deposition, the lawyer on the other side asked if he could take the documents, a box home at night, look them over because it would save time the next day. I said, sure, Mr. S, gave it to him. The next day, I looked around. I didn't see any of the documents. I asked, well, where are the documents I gave you to look at last night, sir? He said, well, Paul, I have to tell you, Sorry to say this, when I was reviewing them last night, I saw such criminality, I had to send them over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. At which point, yours truly was about to faint because he knew he would get fired. It was, at any rate, at about 10 minutes later, he said, let's take a break. Susan, bring in Sandler's documents, brought the box in. Here's a lesson to you, Paul. Never give opposing counsel documents you haven't read. Okay, there's an example of opposing counsel helping a young lawyer. One time I answered, I had a deposition. I couldn't get away from a non-leading question. Opposing counsel said, let's take a break. Different lawyer. Paul asked the question this way. So if you announce to senior lawyer, this is your first or second time, you should get some comfort level from that. And you should also have a mock trial or practice. And then you go through it. You wouldn't The key to being a great trial lawyer, as I said in the beginning, unless you're like a brilliant genius, you have to try cases, 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 cases. One or two cases doesn't make you a great trial lawyer. If you try many cases, you'll feel it in your blood. You'll get the energy. And lastly, what has helped me has been reading little bios of great trial lawyers in history. In one of my books, I have a whole chapter one about 30 great trial lawyers. And when you read about what they did, it inspires you. And it, to be inspired is the key to get the energy. And then you're on your way. I love that. I think being inspired is something that we don't really think about too often, that it's not just about what we do, but lean on others. Look at what others have done, who's paved the way, and just really be passionate and feel you know good about what you're doing at the end of the day. So I think that that's really important. One thing just occurred to me, one of my books, I did not get published so I could give it free. And in my boot camp trial training programs I do with the American College and the ABA, I give to every attendee a electronic version of the book. It's called Essays on Persuasion and Rhetoric for the Courtroom. I offer any of your wit- <laughs> listeners, not witnesses, to email me and I'll send you a complimentary copy. Well, thank you. And that's actually a perfect segue because I was going to say in wrapping up this episode, I know you're an author, you do lectures, you do boot camps. Tell our listeners where else they can find you, whether it be LinkedIn, a website, just where they could reach out if they wanted more advice. Email me. Perfect. What's your email? Well, you can get a okay, PMS <laughs> at Shapiro, S-H-A-P-I-R-O, S-H-E-R dot com. Perfect. Thank you so much. They also can be on the lookout for the ABA and American College of Trial Lawyers program, which I created, which is called Anatomy of a Trial, One Day Boot Camp for Trial Training for Young Lawyers. Perfect. Well, that sounds super helpful. And Mr. Sandler, thank you again for joining me today and offering insight into the trial world, which I personally think is a super fun world. So I appreciate it so much. You're quite welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Listeners, we're going to take a quick break. And when we're back, we will be doing Pop Law with Julie Mero.
This episode is brought to you by the American Bar Association's Young Lawyers Division. Starting a new career in the law can feel overwhelming. The ABA YLD provides resources, CLE, and a network of peers from coast to coast to help you settle into your new legal career. Claim your Young Lawyer membership for just $75 at ambar.org slash join. You like legal podcasts because you're curious and want to be the best attorney you can be. I'm Dave Scriven Young, host of Litigation Radio, produced by ABA's Litigation Section with Legal Talk Network. Search in your favorite podcast player for Litigation Radio to join me and my guests as we examine hot topics in litigation and topics that will help you to develop your litigation skills and build your practice. I hope you'll check out Litigation Radio and join the ABA Litigation section for access to all of the resources, relationships, and referrals you need to thrive as a litigator. Good morning, Julia. Here today we're talking about makeup. We are talking about makeup, Montana. How are you? I am good. I'm excited to get into this one. The male listeners of our podcast might be like, makeup? What is this? What is this that we're talking about? But I promise it sounds like it's going to be very interesting. So hang with us. It is. And it applies to them too. And yes, thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Marrow, and this is Pop Law, where pop culture meets the law. And we are talking about makeup, but it's really just, I would say, um, hygiene products in general. Anything that you put on your skin and your hair on your body could fall into this. So Sephora is in trouble. Um, They've put out these products for a couple of years now. It's their clean products line. As we know, a lot of companies are doing this, especially as if you are a makeup wearer, you know that there are a lot of issues that have come to light probably the last decade or so with chemicals that we put on our skin every day and of really the long-term effects that those can have. So product lines, rightfully so, have tried to make cleaner products that have less, you know, it's the same as food. It's just the same revolution that you've been seeing in the food industry of, I want to be able to pronounce the ingredients that are on what I put in my mouth, the same as what I put on my face. And so Sephora, you know, like there are several other companies also that are facing similar lawsuits, but I think Sephora is definitely the biggest right now. And there's class action uh, alleging that their so-called clean products are not really clean at all. They're loaded with synthetic ingredients and irritating chemicals the same as they have been for years. They just, you know, maybe move things around a little bit and call them different things and then advertise it as the new clean Sephora line. (laughs) And it's kind of sad because I think that, and I've been seeing things like this, not only in the cosmetic or beauty product industry, but a little bit in the food industry too, of some of the gluten-free things and those sorts of products they're starting to find out now really aren't what they've been advertised to be. And I don't know, Sephora is saying, oh, no, no, no. And they're ready to fully defend themselves. But I guess a big issue here is what the definition of clean is. And I don't think that the cosmetic industry has a true, you know, what they would consider their legal definition of clean. It's going to vary from company to company and product to product too. One of the articles I read say that the definition, dictionary definition of clean is free from impurities, or unnecessary and harmful components and pure. So I think that's pretty broad as yeah. a lawyer personally. <laughs> what do you yes. think, Montano? That would have been a frustrating <laughs> definition in law school for sure. I was going to say, I, maybe they could just use the word cleaner, <laughs> you know? Yes. Cleaner than they were before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's also, I don't know how you, you couldn't really just take that definition and insert it into the cosmetic or hygiene product industry because harmful to one person could be perfectly fine to someone else. But they looked into some of the ingredients and they found that they are pretty common to be irritating and to cause reactions. So that's frustrating because I think, and I always question that a lot with these products, is am I using something that's making me need to just use it more? Yeah, right. When you step back and it's like, well, what would happen if you didn't use half of this stuff? Is it actually just harming you more than it's helping. And I think that this lawsuit is sort of bringing that to light and there will be many, many more to come because unfortunately I think there's probably been more false advertising 
than we would have thought. But it also goes back to consumer responsibility in a sense. And like, if you're that concerned, maybe we need to Google before we buy something, Google the ingredients or really look into it. But I'm sure Sephora will pay out for sure, but I don't think it will be the end of of Sephora or any of these no. cosmetic lines because you do have to put some responsibility on the consumer. And it's also just tough, right? Like we said, I mean, what one person might think is clean might not be the next person's definition. And one person might just have the goal of, like we said, cleaner products, right? Or there might be one certain ingredient that they're trying to not use. So I think it's very subjective on the person. And I agree with you. I don't think this is going to be the end of Sephora, but it'll definitely be interesting to see because how are you going to advertise if your product is cleaner without using that word? You know, it's just going to be very interesting. Cause I do think people do care about that rightfully. So, and it's just interesting because sometimes the word clean is just the word that's used. There might not be saying, Hey, look, we're saying this is organic and just coconut oil and whatever it is. Right. But how, how they're yeah. going to advertise those will be very interesting. Yeah, and what does clean really mean? And that's what the big controversy between like the FDA and versus the dermatologist versus the cosmetic industry is that they all can't really agree on the harmfulness of the chemicals and what what is clean to one is not clean to another. So Exactly. All right. Well, that's also interesting. I would I definitely am a Sephora shopper, also Ulta, but I I too have been trying to do more clean choices in my life. Like you're talking about the gluten-free products and that's, I've been trying to only buy, this is going to sound so lame, but sourdough bread (laughs) because I've heard it's less harmful on your, right? It's, I've heard it's less harmful on your gut. And I was like, I'm going to try that. But one person might hate sourdough and they might need to go gluten-free completely. So like you said, it's very subjective, but uh, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens down the road and if these actually carry any merit with these lawsuits. Yeah, I've heard that. And something real quick, I heard recently, maybe a trend with men is that they're realizing a lot of their products have decent amounts of estrogen in them. Yes. And so they become aware. And so they're wanting to use cleaner um, products. And I'm like, well, I don't know if you were really that affected by the estrogen, but I support this. You're (laughs) like, but if you don't want to use it, that is totally fair. Yes. Now you understand what what we're thinking all the time. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you again so much for joining us and giving us some really interesting stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Montana. And we'll talk to you next time. I'm Julie Marrow and this is Pop Law. Thank you for listening. Well, listeners, as always, that's our show. And thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please recommend our show to a friend. You know where to find us. Until next time, I am Montana Funk, and you've been listening to Young Lawyer Rising, brought to you by the ABA Young Lawyers Division and the audio professionals at Legal Talk Network. Hey, Guy, what's up? Just having some lunch, Conrad. Hey, Guy, do you see that billboard out there? Oh, you mean that guy out there in the gray suit? Yeah, the gray suit guy. Order up. There's uh, all those beautiful, rich, leather-bound books in the background. That is exactly the one. That's J.D. McGuffin at Law. He'll fight for you! I bet you he has got so many years of experience. Like decades and decades. And I bet, Guy, I bet he even went to a law school. Are you a lawyer? Do you suffer from dull marketing and a lack of positioning in a crowded legal marketplace? Sit down with Guy and Conrad for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing on the Legal Talk Network, available wherever podcasts are found.